Hey everybody, welcome to our new episode, our session, if you will, of the Bali Chronicles set in Chicago. We are kicking things off on the precipice of a weekend that's going to be very, very busy in the city of Chicago for the undead. Now, where we last left off with our guys, we had a lot of catching up to do with Lamont since he was not there the night prior and a lot of things had gone down. Now, coming into the weekend, it's just the end of Thursday night. People are getting ready to go to sleep for the day, wake up on Friday. On Friday, they have a meeting with the Bahari at the Drake Hotel. That's through one of Preston's contacts. Later on that night at 11, they have a meeting with Prince Jackson, as Jackson is called pretty much an all-hands meeting for those in the city that aren't Thin Bloods because they don't really count, you know? And then we have probably a bunch of other chaos because these guys tend to just stick their noses in fucking everything. So that's how things go. Preston has no longer said the words. He's been very careful about that. Lamont is trying not to yell at his brothers too much, but he's still kind of slipping down again. And Sullivan has just learned how to speak and read Acadian scripts. So there's a mystery within the Well of Sacrifice they can now start solving. That being said, gentlemen, bed down for the day as the sun starts to encroach upon your supernatural existence and forces you into a deep slumber that is very akin to death. All drama aside, as you guys start to come to your senses on Friday evening, you start that usual, I guess, shaking off of the torpor of the day as your senses slowly start to come apart in bits and pieces. Your sense of smell, your sense of touch, your consciousness arouses. And speaking of rousing, we all need to do a rouse check for waking up in the evening on Friday. Sounds oh. good to me. Sullivan's good. He does not feel the hunger with one success. Preston gains a point of hunger, which should put you at two by my record. Correct. You can do it, Lamont. I have faith in you. And Lamont gets up just fine as well. So for Sullivan and Lamont, you wake up, your body animates itself with no worse for wear, no more than the usual subtle gnawing in the back of your soul as the hunger is just kind of ever present. But there with Preston, again, you wake up, it's your beast taking its tithe as it reanimates your body. But some of that sustenance you had the night before is slowly weaning its way out of your system and your hunger is starting to rouse itself a little more in the back of your mind. You're still okay. It's just making itself more present. Now, Wake up Friday night. You don't have a meeting until 8.30 at the Drake. It's not going to take you that long to get down there, even with weekend traffic. So you guys have probably about two or so hours, being that it's still February, to do things around the warehouse loft or to get food, whatever you would like to do. What's the plan, guys? Uh, well, I'm supposed to meet um, the uh, the other tattoo artist um, tonight, right? On Tuesday. Tuesday. On Tuesday, okay. Um yeah, I mean, I won't. I won't do anything out of the ordinary. I won't waste your time with. I'm going to do a bunch of things. Character gets up, cleans himself, waits for them to get ready. Um, okay. Pretty much per normal. This is the the Drake Hotel thing. Is the citywide thing? No, that's the Bahari. Your thing. Yes, you called your contact um, about what was going on with the garden because you made it. You found out a little more details about yeah who had got a bulldoze. That's, I must have messed up. I have that on my sh on my notes. It's Saturday. Oh no, that's a that's a Friday with, uh, thing. with Trina. Yeah, I have it as a Friday, so maybe we had a little bit of miscommunication. But it is this no evening. Worries. Is the the night before the prince's meeting? Well, the night of the prince's meeting, but before it, because she made a point of saying, "Hey, let's get out there before Jackson and everybody come to the the woods." So, sure, I would like to. If I have a cup, you said we have a couple hours. Yeah, you guys have like two or you know. Uh, it's about six, so like two and a half hours or so. Uh, I'm assuming this is probably like a uh, like a fancy dress affair, right? Well, the one with the prince or the one with the Bahari? Yeah, I mean, either way. <laughs> well, the Bahari is pretty much like they were looking for a place that was safe to meet, and one of her people had the ability to use a room at the Drake. So that's kind of a come-as-you-are type situation. With the prince's meaning, it's not actually at an Elysium. It's off at Laba Woods which is north of where you guys are at, but south of Evanston. It's like a forest that, preserve. That sounds ominous. Okay, totally fine. Uh, that probably doesn't require me to dress up because it's cold outside. No, that's definitely not going to be a suit and tie affair. Cool. We'll let you both know that I have uh, 
definitely successfully learned Acadian, and I can start teaching you when you are ready. I have not gone downstairs to read the script yet. I figure we should probably all do that together. It should also be days. Okay. Uh, actually, Ray, uh, my character will be spending the um, at the early uh, parts of the day or night, rather, um, just practicing artwork, drawing, um, working on back tattoos for uh, the three fellows who I have to tattoo. Fair enough. That's not a problem. Um, you pull out the sketch pad and start getting to work just with some designs and doodling around a bit. So Lamont is working on his sketchbook to see about some ideas for these back pieces. Sullivan lets everybody know that, hey, I can read the script now. I understand it. I can decipher it. Preston wakes up and doesn't have any rats or flies in his sleeping area. That's different. It is. And uh, no droppings anywhere? Nope. You actually don't even hear the skittering of the rats behind the walls anymore. Damn, dude, you, you, you got rid of your friends. I didn't get rid of shit. I don't know what happened to them. Oh, that was no. me. You guys hear V from the living area? And he's just sitting there, like, leaning back against the windowsill, drinking a cup of tea. Um, why? Well, it's going to be <laughs> bothering your broodmate. And he kind of gestures towards Lamont with his, his tea cup before taking another sip. And he's, like, usually he's wearing this nice black suit when you see him. Uh, okay, second question, how? I asked them to. Just kind of be gone for a little bit. So where'd they go, did they say? That's a whole lot of not my fucking problem. Tastes another sip of his tea. All right, fair enough. Uh, listen, guys, I'm going to try and run out uh, for a bite to eat before we uh, head to this meeting, uh, just so that I'm on the level for it. Uh, tag along or not, whatever. I I'm going to be try and be quick because we only got a couple hours. Okay. Sure, I'll come along with you. I'm not going to feed, but I'll, uh, you know, save it that way, I guess. Yeah. Okay. I guess I'll, I'll wait here and hold down the fort. Cool. I'll hang out with you. This is V kind of gives you a smile. If you can critique my artwork. Ooh. Sounds like fun. And you'll see him kind of walk through one of the couches as he moves over to where you're sketching. Like and moves through it like intangibly so? Yes, he just walks that's, right through it. There's That's like, that's creepy. I mean, like, I don't care who you are. That's just creepy. <laughs> <laughs> well you know he's not physically here you discovered that when you first met right. him right I, I know <laughs> it's still one of those things where it's like just walks right through right it's still you're you know it's like you're intangible but you're tangible it's weird I can creep he probably watches us while we sleep too I, I would if I had the power to I can neither <laughs> confirm nor deny that it's just a thing. So Preston and Sullivan are heading out to grab a bite to eat for Preston to kind of sate some of that hunger that's kind of gnawing him a little bit. What's the plan, guys? How do you want to do this? Because if you want to grab a quick bite, that's different than grabbing a safe bite if you'd get my my drift. Yeah, I definitely don't want to um, risk being late because this is an important meeting. So um, it sounds like we'll, we'll be on the quicker end of things. Um, I'm given that it's still pretty early out, it's it's going to be not a type of situation I'm thinking where we could go to a crowded bar and do that whole thing. So I'm thinking maybe catch you know catch some people pre gaming for the night. It is a, it is still Friday in yep. the city. Um, catch some people pre gaming, bar hopping or whatever, and and try and lure, you know lure somebody in into a into an alley or something under the guise of hey, got to okay. smoke. Hey, I need some help. S Something so. Like that. You want to kind of go against your predator type a bit, your usual hunting grounds, which are the bars and the clubs, and you're just, like, outright hunting <laughs> the neighborhood. I'm going to have to, yeah, unless there's a, there's an opportunity um, to, to go with my with my predator type, which I'm not really sure that... You're, you're looking at about for that. a little over an hour to probably do that. You know, a, couple, a little bit of travel time to get down to a proper area, and then about an hour to carouse and grab somebody. If you want to just drive around the neighborhood, that could probably get you a little more. It'd be a little more difficult to do so, but it's going to be quicker. If I can make it back in time, if there's a place I know that I can go where there's some nightlife happening and I can kind of uh, feed into my strength, then I'll I'll do that. Sure, sure, yeah. You guys head a little bit south to the upper edge of 
you know, some of the more populous areas in terms of like nightlife and clubbing. So just a little bit, a bit north of River North. And you basically start checking in to see who's the early drinkers in the, the city. Who's going to be out right now getting a couple of drinks, things of that nature. Let's go have you have a roll your predator dice for hunting. We'll put the difficulty at a three because you're kind of trying to be in a little bit of a rush. I'll kind of, like I said, I'll kind of be working as Ooh. a spotter. Well, he gets his three. It takes you about a half an hour. You guys are coasting out a couple places. You guys found a place to park. You walk by a couple bars. Most of them aren't really busy right now. There aren't a lot of people out this early in the night because really it's like 6.30 by the time you get there. So at most you're kick picking up people who are just getting off of work or just getting out of classes for the day and starting to get ready for the evening and the weekend. So you are finding primarily pre-gamers, but there's not that many in this part of the city. They'd be a little further south. So... You go through two or three different bars, just kind of wandering by. Sullivan's checking the inside out. He'll give you kind of a shake of a head if there's not really enough people in there that, in it, or it doesn't look good. But after two or three places, you finally find one. And you manage to work your magic in like 20 or so minutes. It's a little quick. It feels a little rushed to you. But at this point in time, you really don't have much of a choice. You want to get some food. You want to get in and out. Now, when you grab somebody and kind of pull them off to the side and take your one hungers worth of blood from them there are a couple things here that you kind of come to realize one the rack was fucking amazing you felt like a king when you went to the rack the night that lamont was busy yeah that was the, the field was yours it was a ripe time of the night it was even just a thursday but it was still so busy and your hunting was so efficient that it was you just had your pick of the crowd this is like you're getting you're scraping the bottom of the barrel it's it's blood and it's still great. It's still amazing. It states that hunger and gives you that rush of life and sensation that you crave. But it's not as fun. This is too hurried. It's too rushed. It's not your type of hunting, which leaves you feeling a little uncomfortable after the whole experience is said and done with. Um, basically, you pull aside a basically an exhausted worker from the day who's just been praying for the weekend and you're that first friendly face that looks like they could be a really nice distraction and you pull her aside you know you guys kind of go out back of the of the bar it's a little like neighborhood bar really and you put the bite on her as you go out for a cigarette quote unquote sate your one hunger lick the wound and kind of send her back in she was already tipsy when you met her so she's woozy as hell after you drink the blood now, the blood comes with that rush of that sanguine resonance, you know, that that hotness of desire and ambition that's just boiling beneath the surface of this individual. And when you walk away, she goes back into the bar, you walk down the street to meet up with Sullivan, you can feel your skin with that warm rush of the false life after drinking from this victim. But you also feel a little bit in the back of your mind that alcohol just taking effect just enough to throw your balance off a little bit that you have to occasionally double check your sureness of footing as you're walking down the snowy alleyway back towards your broodmate. Now, the whole affair to get out, to go and grab somebody, sit your one hunger and make it back to the warehouse loft takes you roughly about an hour and 15 minutes. So by the time you get back, it's like 7.30. Nice. You guys cool. still have an hour before you have to be down at the Drake Hotel and you have until 11 o'clock before Prince Jackson is having his meeting in the woods. Now, while you're outside, it's still February, so it's still really cold. That wind is just biting. It's cutting through most of the clothing that you're wearing, especially since Preston's tends to favor the lighter things that are more, like, fashionable as opposed to secure against the cold. Mind you, you know, you're dead. Your body doesn't really feel it the same anymore, but it's just that annoyance of it being so cold and frigid. And while you've managed to kind of get by in your quick ins and out of hunting tonight without having to kind of rouse the blood to give yourself the false life to look mortal and like you know a lot more of a i guess a long-term walk or setting you know that it's going to be a necessity if you guys go out tonight if you head to the drake if you're out in public before you go to the woods the woods may not be a big deal because it could be a bunch of other kindred but especially when you go to the drake you're gonna have to kind of force the blood through your system to, to put that you know that false appearance of life on your fe features, really, because it's too cold for it to go unnoticed if you're not breathing steam at this point. It's still just below double digits, like maybe seven or eight degrees outside before wind chill, so it's pretty crisp. Yeah, I'll um, 
I'll wear a heavier coat too when we go out just to okay. try and stave off some of the general discomfort. Need, I need some level of comfort after that and the fact that the feeding wasn't it got the job done, but it really just wasn't as satisfying as I would like it to have been. Not as all not at all. And mostly when you've kind of been going out lately, you guys have had some pretty good hunts. Even when you've yeah. had to rush it, this was really kind of disappointing. So I mean that's kind of something you're carrying with you as you get back to the house. Um, outside, when you guys pull back up to the warehouse loft, you see that wretched looking cat wandering the alleyway. Like it's looking for the rats and it can't find them. It looks kind of pissed. If a cat can look upset, this cat definitely looks upset. Like just the way it's staring at you as you guys pull up, like how dare you, you fucked with my food. And it just slowly turns and walks down the alleyway away from you. Like with disdain in its steps. I'm fucking weird about that cat. Yep. But for Lamont, the time that your roommates have been out, your roommates have gone out hunting for Preston, V's just kind of standing over your shoulder, mm -hmm. and you just hear that occasional, hmm, I like that. Maybe that line could be a little thicker right there. Oh, no. Great decision. He's, <laughs> it feels like a somebody who took art history class and is now mm -hmm. critiquing work. It's a subtle bit of noise. Just shut the fuck up while I do my work, would you? Mm -hmm. um, and as you like, look over your shoulder once or twice with just that that look in your eyes, like I really hate you. He eventually shuts up, and maybe after twenty or thirty minutes, when you look around, he's just gone. He's outright vanished again. A little mm -hmm. bit over an hour passes, and your broodmates arrive. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll pack up the uh, the drawing stuff and throw it in a bag and. I'll, I'll wait for them. Apparently nothing bad happened because it didn't take very long for them to get back. Nope. Preston looks a little not as happy as, as he sometimes seems after a good feeding. Like this is definitely some disappointment in his general aura as he walks in essentially. Okay. Uh, no luck? No, nah, we got the job done. It was just fucking boring. He didn't get to enjoy it. Fucking just, it was like maintenance. It was like jerking off. It was just. You're such a diva. <laughs> next time, next time I want to go back to the rack. That was fucking great. Holy yeah. shit. That whole place was like buzzing. It was amazing. But uh, anyways, we got like an hour. Do we want to go down and try and uh, start just like try and start looking at some of the writing down there? I just don't want to get caught up in something. Because remember, some of this text we didn't do. So I don't want to get caught up in research or to be just fair, time in general. Doing there this. have been no casual trips down to the basement. Mm -hmm. So that's true. That's kind of. I'm willing to agree on this particular. Uh, Later tonight or tomorrow. Yes, the night is young. All right. Yeah, uh, I'll get ready and just wait to go pretty much. Not much you can do in an hour, really. Okay. Yeah. So you guys just kind of kill time around the, the warehouse lot for a bit before you need to head out. You give yourselves about a good half an hour to drive down and find parking. Um, mind you, you can park at the Drake, but that's going to be expensive, especially since you don't have the room there. But you give yourself a little bit of time to kind of fish out a spot to park that's going to be cheaper than normal. Maybe you spot hero it. Who the hell knows? But you get a cheaper spot, maybe a block or so away from the Drake. You get kind of lucky. And... You guys kind of make your way towards the hotel. Now, does anybody not want to institute the blush of life? Uh, no, I, I definitely will. I don't. Yes, I will. Uh, I will rouse real quick to see if I can. Okay. Let's get the round of rouse checks. Nice. Solvin, once it says you're good, you force the blood through your system. You mimic this this false appearance of life. You're blinking a bit more. You've kind of oh. got a little bit of color to your face, and you're actually exhaling you know, a heated mist. Preston, it's just the right night, man. Yeah, you're right back head. to two. You push the blood through your system, but you feel a bit emptier. You, you can't help but notice it as you force the blood through your body. It's okay, Sean. Tonight, we'll get a sacrifice. We'll all partake, and then we will all sacrifice. It'll be good. It'll be good. It'll be a family trip. Lamont? Uh, I, got a, I got a success. Oh, awesome. So Lamont, much like Sullivan, managed to kind of force the blood through your system. You kind of feel that weird rush of warmth kind of go through the, the top layer of your skin as you assume this 
this mimicry of life, essentially. Mm -hmm. So the three of you walking on the street now are breathing out steam as one would expect. You're blinking occasionally. You've got a little bit of color to your cheeks that the wind actually affects and makes you a little more rosy as the cold just kind of bites into your skin. You make it to the Drake, towards the front of the Drake, and you can hear the traffic all around you. It's a Friday night. It's still early. The night's just starting to kind of kick off downtown, really, for people who are going out shopping and seeing things. You can see that um, there are just groups of people walking down the street together, even in the cold, just wanting to get out of the house and wanting to do something. It's the weekend. We just got off work. We need to do something. And so people are out about trying to see what they can get involved in. When you start walking towards the main doors of the Drake, for Preston, you manage to see your contact. Now, this is the, excuse me, your gang girl contact, Trina um, Velasco. She's the country gang girl you knew from the Sabat that was in the Bahari and kind of split off from the sect when they took off to the Middle East. She's sitting outside wearing a pair of blue jeans, some loose boots, a leather jacket with like a hoodie inside. The hood's up around her, her head, and she's got a scarf around her neck as well, and she's smoking a cigarette. You can tell as you walk up that she hasn't tried to assume any false semblance of humanity. She's just smoking to try to make up for it. Now, for Sullivan and Lamont, when you run across her, the first thing that strikes you is that she's a bit more pallid than you would think to see for a person just standing out here. Her beast, when you step close, you can kind of feel it almost just beneath the surface of her. This is a woman who's not very close to her humanity at all, and it shows. But she's trying to cover it up with a bulkier clothing and by having that cloud of smoke around her face at almost all times. When she okay. sees Preston, she just gives him a nod. Good you can make it. Yeah, you too. Looking good. You, you could almost be mistaken for one of your cousins. I hate you sometimes. Um, are we ready to head upstairs? Do you guys... Need anything? Or you, or first off, do you want to introduce me to your friends? She kind of looks around. You can see that while there are people walking by you, nobody's really paying much attention to you all. Yeah, uh, this is Lamont and Sullivan. Okay, Lamont and Sullivan. Um, if your friends are Preston, I guess we're cool. So why don't you all come with me? And she'll flick the cigarette away and turn and start heading into the Drake. Yeah, since I don't really know uh, what the situation here is, I'm just going to play the role of the new guy on the block. I don't, you know, I just kind of keep quiet until something, you know, sticks out to me. Okay. Same. All right. So basically, it's follow Preston's lead. Yes. So you guys walk into the, the lobby of the Drake, and as Trina's footfalls are echoing on the, the floor, the, the stone floor, essentially... You can see a couple people here and there that are walking through the lobby, either bellboys and people going to their rooms, kind of stop and look at her and give her wide berth because she's literally creeping them the fuck out. <laughs> now, the Drake has had a history of some rather interesting individuals that have come through the city, um, not just Sabat, but even Camarillo members that are a little bit low on the scale, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. So some of the staff are already kind of used to some of the weird night folk that come through, the, the freakazoids that kind of apparently sometimes inhabit the walls of this place. So the staff is a little more easy around. They just kind of like modify their course. Whereas some of the people who are staying here, as you can see like a million about the lobby, are just like, who the hell is that person? That weird stare, like, what is that? As she walks through. But she walks in without a care in the world. She doesn't give it any pause. Just continues on back towards the elevators. Preston follows suit and sort of Lamont and Sullivan. You guys get to the elevator banks. She just waits there. There are two people to the left of you as you guys are facing the elevators that are kind of like occasionally casting glances in her direction. And she just looks over and smiles at them. And you see her kind of pull like a little like tongue between the fangs look. And one of the guys that's standing there is like, what the f And just kind of walks away. She chuckles as he leaves and just looks at Preston and just shakes her head. She's like, you know, I sometimes miss the old crowd. And the elevator Me dings. Too. Good to know. Maybe we should um, do something about that sometime. Not necessarily, I mean, that club's kind of over and done with for me, but it could be fun to do some stuff for old time's sake. And she walks into the elevator. Yeah, probably not here, but uh, definitely some point, somewhere. <laughs> She'll just kind of chuckle and nod. So you all get in the elevator, and she basically takes it up to the 10th floor. 
the write-up is quiet. She doesn't seem to be one for small talk. Doesn't seem like anybody else really wants to discuss because you guys don't even know who, her, who she is really except for Preston. And once the elevator dings and opens up, she leads you down the hall very quietly again to one of the rooms, pulls out a key card, opens it up, and steps inside. It looks like it's a single bedroom. It's overlooking the front, the, well, the street that the Drake is off of. So you can see the traffic out below. You see the lights from the city kind of shining through the windows as the, the blinds are all opened up. The curtains are completely to the side. She just kind of walks in, puts a key card back in her pocket, gestures towards the bed or the seat. She's like, you guys sit wherever the fuck you want. Um... You know, this is really not a, a formal affair, so just get comfortable. And she moves over to sit down on the dresser, essentially. Uh, Lamont will make his way to the window and kind of look out across, you know, the uh, the city. I'll go over and sit down on the bed. Yeah, Sullivan will just pop his glad. Okay. Um, she kind of casts her eyes over you guys, and for those who are seeing her for the first time, she's got these, like, really deep green eyes. Not like a bright emerald, but more like a hunter green. And it's almost unnatural the way they look because the, the rim of the iris, iris is very black against the white of a slayer of her eyes. So they stand out very prominently as she kind of sweeps her gaze over you now. And I'm obscured by the smoke from outside when she was smoking. Her eyes are very odd looking. When she kind of slides them back to Preston, she takes in a breath and lets out this tired sigh. Very resigned. So we've not only lost the garden to bulldozing, but we've lost two members as well. I know you're not as involved with things in the city right now with us, but we could really use some help. What happened? Who who was, uh, who'd we lose? Uh, we lost Yara, who was a member of the Toreador here. She was flirting with the Anarchs, but she's primarily a Camarilla member, relatively young. She was a, a fresh face, a new convert relatively to the scene. We brought her in and she was very attentive, very studious to lessons. We lost Mickey, Nasratu of ours, who was kind of giving us a heads up of what was going on in the city with everything else. He was, put it this way, he was instrumental in finding proper fertilizer for the garden. I don't think these were targeted hits, really. At least not individuals. The only thing they have in common were that they were with us. Neither one is irreplaceable. Again, you know, Yara was new and Mickey was... Yeah, he helped. I mean, he was very valuable, but he didn't provide any service that nobody else could provide, if you get my drift. So I don't feel it was these people were chosen on any basis outside of the fact that they were Bahari. I mean, were they hit at the same time? Or like, were they together and they and they got no. taken out? No. no, it's like a night or two between each individual. We went to their havens after they hadn't shown up for, for worship, and we just found Ash. Any leads? No, not yet. I, I think it might have been the La Sombra in town. They have a thing. They were Sabbat, just like, you know, some of us were. And, well, as we know, the Sabbat don't generally like our religious practices, Maybe the Sombra came to town and felt it was free reign to get some vengeance or some whatever just retribution they feel they're owed by followers of Lilith and struck out. Could be. I mean, they seem pretty occupied with some uh, recent internal uh, struggles and with trying to join the Camarilla here. I'm not sure how much time they're penciling in to go Bahari bashing. I don't really know anybody else who had it out for us in the city. I mean, Jackson, I think, knows. We don't really go out and advertise too much, but we're not ashamed of it, if that makes any sense. I mean, the Camarilla these days doesn't seem to really give two shits about any type of worship that's in their domains, as long as it doesn't infringe upon the prince's duties and responsibilities, yada, 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 yada. And we weren't. We were keeping to ourselves. We were tending our gardens. We were... Having our worship quietly and in peace for the most part. And then next thing I know, we're missing two people around the same time as the Sombra step in. So if you've got other alternatives, I'm all ears to hear them. I think it might be a faction of the Lasombra, but I don't think it would be the the portion of the Lasombra who are um, trying to gain entry into the Camarilla. I mean, truth be told, 
violating a tradition is not a great way to get into the good graces of a Camarilla prince. And if they're just walking in and killing anyone, that's uh, um, that that does that's that doesn't seem smart. That doesn't seem like uh, a very political uh, approach to things. And I definitely don't think it was the prince because why not blood hunt them? No, no, right? the prince. There are a bunch of different ways. I know the prince is pissed because people broke the traditions in his city. Like, that's a given. Like, he, I've actually kind of gotten that sort of confirmation through the grapevine, so to speak. But I have I have no other ideas, you know. I haven't seen anybody. I know the Anarchs don't really give two shits about what we do because hashtag Anarchs, I guess. You know, that's just how they roll. And the only independents in the city are the Ministry. And yeah, we I'm don't sure even have any... Doesn't. I'm sure it doesn't because it's a fake name, but I'm going to ask anyways just to, to make sure we're covering all bases. Does the name Jedediah Jones mean anything to you? Jedediah Jones. Yeah. <laughs> she actually chuckles. No, but it sounds fake as all shit. Um, yeah. What about a name Narissa? Don't, oh wait, no. Uh, yeah. Uh, Blackwater. Yeah? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I heard her. She uh, isn't. She's. She she's, seems like. Let's let's just say we have it, or I have it on good authority that she was attempting to mess with things of a more spiritual bent and speaking with a, a member of the Hakata. Um. So if it's she's trying to narrow down or push out other religions so she can move in. I don't know. It's it's a little bit of an out there thought, but I'm not really I, anything out there. No, these Blackwater well, cultivar. Black Blackwater and her people have actually helped us out. So we share similar viewpoints on some things. So we haven't had any sort of strife with the Blackwaters and their people. Fair enough. Do you know anything about um and I just recently got a little bit of information, but do you know anything about the cult of Shalim here? No. That's the only, you know, just just out fucking around, we get cultivar stuff popping up all the time, like no problem. It's just like these black waters and cultivar shits. When this cult of Shalim is a little bit more um, in the in wind. The yeah, they're yeah. just like, so I just, I don't know if, if you had ever heard of. No, no. I mean, what are they about? Is something we should be worried about? I don't know. That's the thing. Yeah, I got I got bottom. the name for um, a rabbi in the southwest of the city. Um, I got the name for like apparently a, a high priest uh, of the Shalim, and I guess they're feuding with the ministry. We seen was it the Shalim that we caught the street preachers, or was that something different? Because that seemed a very uh, at least the draw was almost like the hedonism aspect. Yeah, I don't think. We were sure. I don't think they gave us right because we haven't checked it out yet. I just yeah. wasn't sure. Yeah, been that's a, a, that's, a that's been next week thing. Probably we got too much shit going on tonight to go and fuck around with that. Well, I'll I'll put some feelers out for this Shalim. I mean, Lucia is still she's one of the Nosferatu. So I can have her kind of see if she's heard about that, and her family's kind of touched on that. Yeah, um, I don't. Yeah, I don't know anything personally. I've I've never actually heard of them, so I'll have to do some digging. Yeah, I, I just I wonder if there's any if it's not, you know, La Sombra, the only other kind of mystery group that I've come across that we've come across is is Shalim. So I think it's probably worth looking into if they're new I'll and trying to establish themselves or something. Maybe they could be striking out against. Um, against the Bahari, but uh, no, that, that fake name was, that's what the permit to get the equipment to bulldoze the the garden was, so I figured it was a fake bullshit name, but I, saw, I thought I'd throw it at you anyways, just in case maybe it was used nope. for something else. Fair enough, no. yeah. I, I, um... I, do, uh, I do have another idea, and take it for a grain of salt, it's just a thing maybe it's the paranoia that uh, infests my brain, but I have noticed a propensity in this city for people, uh, I'm sorry, for kindred, <laughs> to be very specific, to like to rouse anger of one group towards another. 
So I would be very interested if it is not possible that someone who doesn't like maybe the La Sombra and wants to wants you to look in that direction might not be responsible for it. Just an idea, something that I've noticed. A lot of people like to, you know, play the three card Monty with with uh, their enemies. So, no, that's fair. I mean, I'm not above checking that out. It's just they're the only thing that's obvious right now that I can even think of that could be the problem. Um, if it's somebody stirring them up, I don't know. Like. Yeah, I, I think that it, it might be possible that um, you're not too far off with that Sabat concept, but I would be hard pressed to believe it's actually the La Sombra because, well, uh, they're they're trying to get in in good. So right, you can't get in the restaurant when you shit on the later D's shoes. Mm. Well, you you all have been a little more active currently in courts, from what I'm gathering. Do you do you even know who this? Like the name Jedediah. Anybody using that as like a moniker? Anybody using that as like a a calling card? Not that I've come across. No. Not yet, anyways. I feel we like just, I remember that. Yes. Right. I was gonna say we just got the name two nights ago, so we haven't even really had a chance to look into it, talk to anybody about it. All right. Well, <sighs> Preston. I need to know if we find out who did this, you'd be willing to kind of do some shit under the radar with us to handle it. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. You should look at Sullivan and Lamont. I'm not asking you guys to get involved. This isn't your thing, but any assistance would be appreciated. Absolutely. Yep. Fair enough. Um, hey, look, Preston, I'll owe you a favor. You know, thank you for digging into that for me. If you want to learn anything that I can teach, you let me know. You know, I don't really give a shit about the gang girl in the city, nor do I give a shit about the rules of the cam. I'm just kind of here paying lip service to survive. So if there's anything I can do or anything I can teach you, let me know. I will definitely keep that in mind. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, I'm going to grab a bite to eat. I guess I'll see you guys later on tonight in the woods. We'll be there. Yep, with bells on. Well, not really, but you know. Well, you all can enjoy the room for as long as you like. We have until tomorrow night. Just um, don't trash it, yeah? No yeah, no problem. She'll take the key out, the key card, just kind of toss it on the, the little like dresser there by the TV, and she'll just head out very calmly. You see her when she gets the door. She kind of gives one last book, look at you guys, gives Preston a nod quietly, and just slips out. How much time we got before we got to be in the fucking woods? Until 11, so you guys got probably about two hours. Two hours. You want to go eat again? We got two hours. It'll be, the same, time. it'll be the same fucking thing again. Well, it's important to take joy in your work. So yeah, right, right. I'm maybe, gonna wait until we can enjoy it a little bit. Yeah, I'll just maybe, deal with it. I'm okay. Maybe I'll, after I'll we it. have the meeting in the woods. Yeah. Still doesn't seem even remotely on, ominous to me. No. No meetings out in the middle of the woods, out of yes. screaming range. Always. <sighs> I know, a pleasant right. deal. I know most venture princes I've interacted with definitely like having meetings in the woods. So, um, in the middle we... of February. Well, this was really the only thing that I had on the agenda. You guys have anything you want to get done or do or go see? Nothing that we can handle in two hours. No, I, I don't really have anything. Yeah, that that needs to be handled in the time being. Um, you know, maybe we just, uh, you know, go hang out and see what might come our way and then make our way to wherever I don't I don't even know where where these woods are so we'll probably have to use the GPS or something I don't yeah yeah we'll make sure that we head out a little bit early so we're not this isn't the type of thing to arrive fashionably late to uh before yeah, we exactly. go though I I am going to enact my uh my silence of death or whatever they call it now um uh the silence uh and <laughs> I will um maintaining eye contact with the two of them will start searching the room okay so you're looking for like any sort of listening devices and things of that nature i'm assuming I'm, bugs. I'm looking i'm looking for the physical and i'm looking for the metaphysical okay. i'm looking for 
any kind of ritualistic stuff, you know, anything that might, um, you know, we, we met with a Baharist in here and um, I don't know a lot about them, but I do know enough to know that we have to maintain our charade. Um, and for someone to just, I, I was under the impression there was going to be a number of them here because um, mm. I only half listen uh, to <laughs> what, what Preston says. So uh, yeah, I'm just going to look around um, and see if there's anything, anything out of the ordinary. Okay. Basically you start going, you guys see Lamont start going through the room. Uh, he's checking under the, the mattresses, under the pillows, like in the drawers, you know, beside like, you know, in the end tables and in the dressers. Um, you do find the usual Bible in the end table, which kind of gives you a pause for a second. But as it's a mass produced cheap, nobody gives a shit about a Bible. It's not like it hurt pain you to look at. It's just like, oh, fuck you thing. And just close it. Um, the bathroom seems to check out as well. You do, after about 10 or 15 minutes of searching, manage to uncover absolutely nothing. There's nothing okay. metaphysically off here. No ritualistic symbols or any signs of ritual that was done here. There are no listening devices or anything mechanical or technological based that you can find that's in here. All in all, it seems like it's just a bolt hole room yeah. that she came to. To be fair, uh, even if there were like actual technological devices, I don't know that I would be able to pick them up. I don't like I don't know that I would even know what they are. But mostly I'm looking for like the occult stuff. Like okay. I don't I don't predict a gangrel would be like a bug in the foot. Fu- like I don't fucking know. Who knows, I don't man? Know what a bug looks like. I doubt that gangrel does. So Well, you find nothing, thankfully. Um it comes up clean. Okay. Uh, I'll uh put I I'll I'll pick up the key and hand it to to uh to Sean's character. Um this was the extra key, right? She took she took the prime the primary one. She only you only ever saw one, and it's the same pocket she put the key in after she unlocked the door that she drew this one out of, and she put it down. You know, just in case you need a place to bring a date. Yeah, why not? I'll hang on to the key. I'll just put it in the pocket, and then uh, we'll head out, barring anything else. You guys make your way out of the room towards the elevator. Ride the elevator back down to the lobby. Walk across. And you can see a couple of staff members have their eyes on you as you walk out. For Preston and Sullivan, you guys are most recently at Elysium together. Some of the staff you recognize as having worked at the Art Institute that night that you guys went to Elysium. So as you walk out, they just take note of you. They don't say anything. You don't linger their stares any longer than you would think to be polite. But they definitely do look at you and you definitely do recognize them. I will pay them almost no mind. Yeah, same. You guys step back out into the frigid area of Chicago and make your way towards the SUV where you have it parked on the street. Now, it takes about five to ten minutes to walk there. You're having to dodge the occasional group of people who are walking down the street, huddled together, you know, as they're talking about where they're going to go for dinner that night. Um, You make your way around them. You navigate the streets of Chicago back towards your car. And as you're walking towards your car, you round the corner. It's like half a block away. You can see this woman wearing this beautiful fur coat. She's walking down towards you. Now, what's odd is that nobody's around her. She's by herself. And what I mean by that is people are giving her wide berth as she walks down the sidewalk. Like, Chicago has those massive two-sectional sidewalks for the main part of, like, the loop in downtown. So when she's walking down the middle, people just kind of move to the outskirts and let her be. As she gets closer, you notice that she's unreasonably beautiful unnaturally so like this is freaky how gorgeous this woman is and she's walking towards your suv and you see her stop and kind of do one of those lean towards the street like people tend to do when they check a license plate number nods to herself and just stands by turning her back to the car and leaning back against the side of the suv and she's just waiting adjust myself a little bit and uh i'll uh, head on does it look like porsche no, 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 no. Well, that <laughs> that would have been say. a... And then you see Porsche and people go, ah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, I'll just uh, keep walking up as normal. Who's driving? Well, it's Sullivan's car, so he usually does. Yeah, so me probably. So you guys walk up. Uh, when you get within probably about a good 10 or 15 feet of the vehicle, she kind of turns her head and looks towards you and gives a smile. Her face is very 
well done up with makeup, almost flawlessly so. She's got some great lining and great, you know, shades thrown on her features that kind of make her stand out in low street light, you know, like as you're in right now. Her lipstick is this weird shade of crimson that's just darker than like a cherry red, just a little bit darker. Her hair is black and it's pulled back over her shoulder and like a ponytail off to the side. Her fur coat is this brown fur. Uh, she's wearing this black evening gown underneath it and nothing like else. Like there's no pants, no like anything to keep her warm. She's just wearing this evening gown in this frigid conditions and she's wearing black heels. When she turns towards you, she pushes off the car and smiles. Um, this is your vehicle. Yes. And she just kind of, her gaze takes on the three of you. Yes. Uh, this is for you. And she reaches into her fur coat and pulls out a small envelope and kind of holds it out. You go yeah, and take it. it. It's like this um, <clears throat> old paper envelope. Like it's got that stained type of color to it, you know, that yellowish, you know, tannish, like tea color. And it's got this wax seal that sealed the back of the envelope. There's no to or from on the envelope at all. It's just a simple, plain envelope. Um, does she, she walk away, right? Or she, she just hands it out. She, once you take it, she just kind of waits for a second. I guess I'll pop it open and look at it. I will, uh, Lamont will, um, plop his chin, um, on Sullivan's shoulder and <laughs> glance over his shoulder to see, like, I never get letters. I wonder what it is. <laughs> right. So the letter as you open it up is written on like an old, like parchment and it's written in this beautiful, like, somebody took a lot of time to write this. It's written in beautiful, handwritten, like, calligraphy script. The black pen. And it says, you are cordially invited to meet with Mr. Walden at the following address. And it gives you an address just a little bit north of River North. It says, the, the issues of the utmost importance. Please see to it this evening. Well, we have two hours left. So it seems we have something that can actually go two hours. And I'll, I'll hand it back to... One of them. She'll kind of, she, once you hand the, the letter off to of one of your roommates, she just kind of nods. She goes, I just wanted to make sure that it was received. And Mr. Walden looks forward to meeting you. And she turns on her heel and starts walking gracefully back up the way she had come. Now, she appeared to give off all signs of being human, aside from that eerie beauty. You guys know who the fuck Mr. Walden is? That's no idea. That is an interesting question. I was, I assumed you guys would know. But, but it's of the utmost importance. Also, but his delivery lady, delivery lady is fine. I I feel like that's an insult to call her a delivery lady. But I agree with you. <laughs> like unnaturally, like almost yeah. almost uncomfortably. So, yeah, you basically called her a door dasher. <laughs> Maybe she does Uber Eats in her spare time. I don't fucking know. Maybe we. Anyways, I think she the prefers car. the term courier of the night. Let's go talk to I Mr. Like Walden. Cool. Yeah, let's go we got that. two hours to kill. Let's yeah, maybe, she, maybe she needs a ride. Do you need a ride? <laughs> like you call out. She just stops and looks over her shoulder. Unbelievable. And just stares back at you. No, thank you. All right. <laughs> Figured I'd ask. She probably doesn't want to get in the van with three dudes. No. <laughs> it's not a panel van. <laughs> She'll say. <laughs> <laughs> ladies and gentlemen welcome to my life so <laughs> you guys get into the suv she walks up the street and you guys start the car up pull off in the traffic and start heading towards this address this address takes you again into the more residential side a little bit north of river north and you start driving by these brick houses and the address that you drive by that's on this this letter is this large three-story brick Victorian style home with a black wrought iron fence around it, much like its compatriots to either side of it. The home itself, it seems like there is no light whatsoever on inside. There are curtains that are drawn across the windows on the second floor. The third floor is like a small circular window, like an attic area. You can't even see into that. But the bay windows for the main floor that you would walk up to, like up these steps, doesn't have any like blinds or curtains. It's just completely dark inside. Circle the block once or twice. You finally find a spot to park, maybe, you know, a block and a half or so away. Everybody heading over? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. I like All right. to call it the Chicago Shuffle. The three of you make your way to the gateway, well, the outside gate for this house. The gate itself has a latch, but it's not locked. So you just kind of flick it open. It does a little rattle and slightly creaks a little bit as you push it open. More, more likely, it's probably due to the cold that it has a little bit of stiffness to it. You guys walk up these concrete stairs that come to a wooden landing right outside the, the main door. Now, the door itself is this, this dark wood, like a black or a really deep brown. And it has one of those frosted windows on the inside that kind of lets you see into like the foyer there. Um, what you can see in between the bits of frosted glass, it looks like there's like a coat rack there. It looks like there's um, like a light further on back into the house that you can barely see when you make it up, like maybe a candle or so. The door has one of those old like metal knobs that has engravings on it, like it's very much worked metal. Well, um, I guess we probably shouldn't stand on ceremony. Uh, I'll, I'll knock on the door. You knock on the door and everything's silent for a few moments. It takes maybe about a minute or so and you start hearing among the din of the cars going by in the distant streets here and there and maybe a bit of scattered conversation from people walking down the sidewalk across the street from the house you're at. You hear this click clack click clack of somebody walking in heels across like a hardwood floor. And as they start coming that direction, you see the light go on because you can see the light start to emanate from the, the bay windows that's just to your left. And when the light goes on, just kind of catching a glance through the window, there's no furniture in this this house. There's maybe three like wood chairs, but that's about it. There's nothing on the walls, no couches, no TV, nothing big. And as this person gets to the foyer, the light turns on there and you can see this woman, probably about, I'd say, five seven, five eight, with this dark hair, open the door. And when you, she opens it, it's the exact same appearance of the woman you just saw that gave you the letter not 15 minutes ago. She's wearing a red dress, however. Uh, we're nice here. To see you again. We haven't met, but um, I'm sure you mean. I know who you mean. Please, Mr. Walden's waiting. Your twin? Are you a twin? Something like that. She'll step back from the door as she opens it. You hear it kind of creak on its hinges. She just kind of does a sweeping gesture with her free hand towards the living room just beyond. I guess I'll step in. Uh, I will proceed forward because. I'm really interested who this Mr. Walton is. Yeah. In we go. So you guys all walk in. She closes the door after you. The floor in this house is all hardwood. So whenever you step, you're kind of leaving a little bit because there are no, like, mats. You're leaving a little bit of snow on the ground. It's kind of sloshing around as you're stepping across the hardwood. When she leads you into the living room, there are three wooden chairs in a semicircle facing back towards the kitchen. As she steps in be behind you guys, you hear her click clack of her heels against the wood as she kind of veers off and goes further into the house. She disappears into another room, comes back with a large, like, high back chair with, like, a, a red velvet cushioning. And she's holding it with, with her hands on either side of it, but she's lifting up, like, effortlessly. And she goes and places it in front of you guys, well, in front of the, the semicircle of chairs, probably about a good six feet away, conversational distance. Uh, she gives it a pat, makes sure it's steady, gestures to the chairs, like, please, uh, gentlemen, have a seat. Um, I'll go fetch him. I'll sit. I'll take a seat. As you all sit down, she turns on her heel and starts ascending the stairs. You can hear just off to the side. Or she vanishes through another door, another side hall. A few moments later, you hear a more heavy footstep descending these wooden stairs. This gentleman comes into view. He's wearing a very nice business suit. It's pinstriped, like a, a little off dark gray with just a little bit of off-colored stripes on it. Uh, he's got a white you know, dress shirt with a tie. He's wearing a very nice watch that you see as he kind of moves and adjusts his, his suit jacket. It's a gold watch band. Maybe a Rolex or something, else, something alternatively as expensive. It's just really, really nice on his wrist. He's very, very pale of features. You can also, much like when you guys ran into Trina, can feel this man is very far from his humanity. He's not humane at all. He's got a little bit of uh, sunken in features. His eyes give a little bit of a feral glint as he looks around at either of you. And he kind of steps up. Older man, probably I'd say mid-50s at best. Caucasian gentleman. Seems to have like an English bearing, the way he holds himself and the way his jaw is cut. When he sits down in the cushioned chair, he gives you all a very generous smile. 
And it's a smile that's almost too generous because it nearly goes from ear to ear, almost abnormally long. I'm glad you three could make it. I'm Mr. Edward Walton. I don't know. Mr. Walden. I am I hope. Sullivan. Good, good, good. Introductions are very important, Mr. Sullivan. Welcome to this temporary abode of mine, mostly just for the evening, but I bid you welcome nonetheless. Are any of you hungry? No, I'm good. Thank you, though. Uh, yes, actually, I am. Ah, Gina. And she, he kind of looks back at the woman, gestures towards you, and she walks over to you, gets down on one knee, and bares her neck. Uh, I will feed from her. When you drink, you feel that subtle submission that you often feel when you give somebody the kiss as you start sinking your fangs into their flesh. That euphoria that kind of floods your victim and paralyzes them to your will. When she gives into this, there's something beneath it. Like, you can feel her body grow a little bit slack and relaxed, but she steadies herself beyond that. It's like she's used to this sort of situation. And she's met some sort of peace with it so as you slake your one hunger he waits very calmly you see that he doesn't look at Preston as he's feeding he's actually eyeballing both Lamont and Sullivan because that would be rude to eye somebody while they're eating so he's looking at the two of you he folds one leg up you know to put his ankle across one knee and once Preston's sated and licks the wound you'll see that Gina as he has called her stands back up gives him a nod I hope that was to your satisfaction you hear from Walden very good, yes, thank you. I appreciate the hospitality. Of course, Gina, you are dismissed. And um, Can you please do... I'm, I'm not very happy with the way you and your sister gallivant around looking like you do. And you see her smile and look back at him and like, but sir, you, you made us this way. No, I made you other ways. You just simply like this particular mask. Please do something about it. You hear her sigh and she nods and she reaches up to the, the peak of her brow. She grabs that in a tight fist and pulls it back and you hear this subtle like soft wet rip as she pulls it away her face falls forward and it's this bony mask of a skeleton as the the features that you saw that were so beautiful fall forward and when it falls flat you can see the inside of the skin and there's a bunch of different pads of different fatty, fatty tissue and muscle that were made to make her look incredibly beautiful and as that face splits away you see Walden smile and go, that's much better. This is how I made you. More appropriate to be one of my servants. Now, go play. She smiles and nods, and you hear her click-clack and click-clack walk away. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, Lamont will shift uncomfortably in his seat. Uh, oh, so it. I'll, uh, he'll, he'll cross his hands and just set them in his lap to be non-threatening. All right, so that will conclude this episode as they sit down and talk with Mr. Walden. I'm curious to see how they react to his proposal and his request. So we'll see what happens with that next episode. See you guys then.